All right, so here's what we're doing. This is not the kind of video I usually make, but I'm gonna start this off by making something perfectly clear. I am a very strong supporter of emulation. It is the most reliable way of preserving and playing original versions of games that are no longer sold in any official capacity, outside of playing on actual original hardware. And what's nice about emulation specifically is it has the benefit of not being tied to said hardware. So even when the old consoles do inevitably die out, the games themselves will live on. Emulation is in no way illegal. This is something that has been debunked time and time again, so I will not beat a dead horse by explaining it. I'm making this video because of a tweet I saw a couple of weeks ago. I don't have the link to the tweet anymore, but I don't want people to bother the person who posted it anyway, so I will paraphrase. They said something along the lines of, I know emulation itself is not illegal, but you still have to download ROMs, which is illegal. This is complete nonsense. Yes, it is true that downloading copyrighted game files is illegal. Nobody is arguing against that. Whether or not it is morally justifiable is a different conversation, but that's not the topic for this video. What set me off about this tweet is the implication that ROMs and ISOs must be downloaded from the internet. This is far from the first time I have seen this perspective, but seeing yet another misinformed person post something like that has pushed me to make something that will help people understand the reality of how it actually works. Long story short, the idea that you need to download games is false. Game files don't just manifest themselves onto the internet. Somebody has to rip the games, and today I'm going to show you how that person can be you. Just don't upload them to Mediafire. I'm of the belief that when you buy a game or a movie, music CD, whatever, you are entitled to the files contained on the disc. The physical disc itself does not really matter. The reason you spend the money is to get whatever is burned onto it. I think this is especially proven true when you consider how prevalent digital copies of media have become, where a physical disc or cartridge is not present whatsoever. Therefore, you as a consumer should be allowed to make copies of the files for your own personal use in case of any damages. For this video, I'm going to rip a PlayStation 3 game, a PlayStation 2 game, a GameCube game, and a Wii game. I will also demonstrate how to set up the actual emulators for each one. The games I am ripping today I think are particularly well suited for the purpose of emulation, because they are games that are no longer in official circulation. I'll have chapters set up too so you can see whatever section you want. As you can see, I already have a folder here on my desktop sitting between Callie and Marie, containing everything we need to get started. I'll be using this folder for the entire process to keep things contained in one area, besides the handful of points where I'll need to plug in a flash drive or an SD card. I already listed the order I will be doing these, but just for clarification, it will be in order from least complicated to most complicated. So, without further ado. Picking the easiest console to rip games from and run in an emulator was kind of weird, because there are so many different steps and requirements between the four consoles I'm doing today. Ultimately, I decided on PlayStation 3 first, because although there is a bit of setup necessary, you do not need any kind of modded hardware to get going. So here we go. First off, download the emulator, RPCS3. You can find it on the official site, which I have linked in the description. Check out the download tab, find your operating system version, and let it go. After it's downloaded, you can go to where you have it saved and extract the zip file. Then go into the folder and open up RPCS3. It gives you this cute little prompt telling you about the quick start guide and some other stuff. It even gives you a big scary warning about piracy. RPCS3 does not condone piracy. You must dump your own games. Well, the good news is that's what we're doing. But first, let's set the emulator up. Check the boxes and click continue to be brought to RPCS3's main window. Right now, as it is, it cannot run any games. It is naked, exposed to the elements. It needs official PlayStation 3 firmware if it wants to survive the winter. Lucky for us, Sony supplies an official download for the latest firmware that I have linked in the description. Now, before someone starts complaining, Oh no! He's downloading! He's downloading! Let me reiterate. This is official. Sony does this so you can download it and update your PS3 console in the event that it is not connected to the internet. Which is kind of what we're doing, in a way. You get the file and save it wherever you want. I have it in the same place as RPCS3. 
Go back to RPCS3, go to File, Install Firmware. Point it to the file you just downloaded. It should be called ps3update.pup and click OK. RPCS3 will start installing the firmware and after a minute or so, Congratulations, you now have a functional version of RPCS3. That's all it takes. Cool, now you just need a game to play. There is a bit of a catch to this, but bear with me. You can rip PS3 games with a modded PS3, naturally, or you can do it with a standard PC Blu-ray drive. If you are going with the Blu-ray drive, be aware that there are only a handful of models that actually can read PS3 game discs. I happen to have one that is compatible, so that's what I'm gonna do. You will have to check for yourself if your drive is compatible. There is a compatibility chart on the RPCS3 website. I don't believe this list is comprehensive, so there is a chance your drive may work even if it's not on here, but these are the ones that are known to be fine. Anyway, go ahead and download the PS3 disk number from its GitHub repository I have linked in the description. It's also linked on the RPCS3 website. After you download the PS3 disk number zip, go ahead and extract it. It is a single.exe file. Open it, and you'll be prompted to insert a PS3 disc, so go ahead and put the game you want to rip into your disc drive. I will be ripping Katamari Forever, because as I mentioned before with my selection, this is a game that was released one time on the PS3 and has not been released since. It is a perfect candidate for a digital backup. Windows Explorer might pop up when you insert the disc like mine does here. Don't worry about it, it's just an autoplay thing. Go ahead and close that. I will admit that has confused me a few times. After a few seconds, the disk dumper will find a matching decryption key from a database. At which point, you can click the big ass start button and have it start ripping and decrypting the game disk. By default, it'll create a folder for the game next to the disk dumper executable. It does take a few minutes, so just be patient. It'll tell you when it's done, and afterwards you can go ahead and close the disk dumper. After all that, you should be ready to start playing an RPCS3. Bring the emulator window back up, click open game and point it to the folder where the game is located the PS3 underscore game folder, specifically. And away you go! You are now completely legally emulated in a PlayStation 3 game. PS3 emulation is remarkable. Even two or three years ago, running a game just as easily as this would have been unthinkable. So the fact that it's already at this point after just a couple years is insane. I bought a used copy of Skate 3 last year and played it for the first time entirely with RPCS3, and I had no issues. Anyway, that's it for RPCS3. Now, let's go back a generation. Alrighty, the PS3's dad. I'll start by saying we will need an actual console for part of this. So if you don't have one, uh, get one. You are also going to need Free MC Boot, which is a soft mod allowing us to run homebrew apps such as the one I'm about to talk about, Biostrain. Biostrain is the recommended tool by the PCSX2 team for dumping the PS2 BIOS from your console, and it's incredibly easy to use. Head on over to the GitHub link in the description to download Biostrain. It's a single .elf file. All you have to do is get a flash drive, format it to FAT32, and stick Biostrain on there. No folders, no nothing. Plug it into your PS2 and start it up. As I mentioned before, you will need either free MC boot or free HD boot to do these next steps, including accessing this funny looking menu. You can either install it yourself or buy a memory card with it pre-installed from Amazon for like $15, which may be your best option if you have a slim PS2. It is plug and play, so don't worry about it too much. Anyway, once you have your PS2 with free MC boot going, you wanna head straight for ULaunch Elf. It's basically a file manager that lets you run ELF files, which are a type of executable the PS2 can run. The one we want is the biostrain.elf we put on our flash drive just a moment ago. Press circle to open the file browser and navigate to mass, which is the flash drive. Press circle again to enter it and right away you should see the biostrain.elf file we added to it. Select it by pressing circle and it will start up right away. The biostrain screen is very simple, just a black background with some text and a logo. The dumping process will start automatically and only takes a minute or so before it says finished everything at the bottom. After it finishes, go ahead and power off your console and take out the flash drive. Then put the flash drive back in your computer. When you open the flash drive back on your computer, you'll see biostrain.elf is still there, but now there will be a handful of files next to it. These are your PS2 BIOS files. Keep this window open because we'll need them in just a second. 
At this point, you can download PCSX2 from the official site if you haven't already, which is linked in the description, and extract it wherever you like. It is worth noting I am using the portable version. Go ahead and open PCSX2, tell it what language you want, and click Next. It'll give you a big list of plugins, the defaults are fine, just click Next again. Now, as you can see, it is asking for the BIOS. Notice now there is a folder that was created called BIOS. Open that folder and copy your BIOS files from your flash drive into that folder. Go back to PCSX2 and click Refresh List at the top. You should now see an option appear. It'll say what region the BIOS is and some other details. I happen to have a Japanese console, so you'll notice my region says Japan, but it doesn't matter one way or the other. It's an emulator, there's no region locking, so whatever. Select it, click Finish, and huzzah! You now have a legal, functioning PlayStation 2 emulator. Now, let's get a game for ourselves. Ripping PlayStation 2 games is, in all ways, probably the easiest of any other console. You do not need any special hardware or software. All you need is a standard disk drive and image burn, which is an incredibly normal disk burning and ripping application. Image burn is also linked in the description. Go ahead and download the installer and install it like anything else. Once it's done, open up Image Burn and put your PS2 game disc in your disk drive. This time, I'm doing a copy of Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. There is a remaster of the original Sly Trilogy on PS3, admittedly, but that is the last this game was released in any official capacity. Image Burn will recognize it after a second or so, then you click Create Image File from Disk. You'll be given a new screen with some information, and you can choose where you want the ISO file to be created. I'll pick the emulators folder I have been using thus far. Give it a name too if you want. Click the big ass button and it'll start spinning the shit out of your disc. Like the PS3 game, this part takes a few minutes, so go ahead and get a snack or something in the meantime. When it finishes... Hi, I'm Paul! When it finishes, you're ready to play. In PC SX2, choose System, Boot ISO Full, and choose the ISO file you just made with Image Burn. You'll get the very very sexy PlayStation 2 boot screen, and the game will start. Congratulations, you now have a completely legal PlayStation 2 emulator with a game running on it. PC SX2 has been around as long as I can remember, but over the last few years or so it has gotten a lot better than it used to be, and it's at a point now where most games are playable from start to finish. It's always so nice to see these things make that kind of progress. The PS2 has an insanely good library, so it's very reassuring knowing these games are able to live on this way. Alright, last on the list is the GameCube. You may have noticed I put Wii in the title card as well, and for a couple of reasons. For one thing, the emulator, Dolphin, emulates both, which is great. Also, the process for ripping the games for both consoles is almost identical as well. I'll get there, so hold tight. Alright, first things first, let's set up the emulator. I have the official Dolphin website linked in the description just like everything else. Go ahead and download it from there, and once again put it wherever you'd like. Extract the zip, and... You're done. Yeah, Dolphin is awesome. You don't need anything, it just runs games out of the box. The only thing you really might want to change right away is to go into your graphics settings and change the backend from OpenGL to either Direct3D or Vulkan for better performance. Assuming you have a dedicated graphics card. So, yeah, that's that part done. Let's move on to ripping a game. Once again, this is a point where you're going to need a real console. In this case, a Wii. And you're going to need the Homebrew channel. I think it is a pretty safe bet that most people have installed the Homebrew channel on their Wii by now. But in case you haven't, I will have a link to the setup process in the description. I'm not going to go into it myself here because, like free MC boot, it is a little bit outside the scope of this video. Get the homebrew channel, then come back. I'll wait. Alright, so you have the homebrew channel. Awesome. So, what we're going to need to do now is add an app to the homebrew channel called Clean Rip. As with everything up to now, there is a link to CleanRip in the description. Download it and extract it wherever you want, and while you're at it, plug your homebrew SD card into your computer. Open the apps folder included in the CleanRip archive. In there you will find a single folder titled CleanRip. This is the one you want. Take that folder and copy it to the apps folder on your SD card. 
With that done, Clean Herp is installed and you can put the SD card back in your Wii. Turn on your Wii and load into the homebrew channel. If done right, you should see Clean Rip in your list of apps. Go ahead and load it up. Also, sorry the video feed on my Wii is kind of fucked. I only have composite cables for it, which is one mistake. But it also started up putting this dark, messy image lately and I don't quite know what's up with that. I saw Matt KC make a video about a Wii he bought that also had this problem. So maybe it's something that just happens with old Wiis. I couldn't say for sure. Rest assured, everything I'm doing will still be visible. You'll get this little disclaimer thing, just skip past that with A. Then it will ask you if you want to enable checksum calculations. Basically, this means once a game is finished ripping, Clean Rip will check to make sure the rip is, like, good. I'm not an expert, but that's the gist of it. I like to enable this, so you can too if you want. Then it wants to know what device you want the game to be ripped to. I'm using a flash drive, so I'm going to choose USB. If you want it to rip to the SD card you're using, be sure to choose that. Afterwards, it asks what file system the drive is formatted for. So let me take this opportunity to explain something. Earlier, I mentioned formatting your drive to FAT32 for the PS2 BIOS dumping process. And as you can see, FAT is an option here. However, please note the other option, NTFS. FAT32 is perfectly fine for GameCube games. But if you are going to be ripping a Wii game, I recommend using NTFS. FAT32 has a maximum file size limit of 4 gigabytes, which will not work for any Wii game as far as I know. Since I will be ripping a Wii game shortly, I have formatted the drive for NTFS, so I'm going to pick that option. It'll say it mounted the drive, hit continue. It'll ask if you want to download these redump.org files. This is for the checksum, so if you enabled that option, say yes. They are small files, so they download in a few seconds. If you come back to this and already have the files, it will ask you if you want to check for updates. Alright, nearly there. Now, you insert the game disc you want to rip. I'm going to be ripping Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. This is a game Nintendo has released one time, and now they pretend it doesn't exist. Like the rest of the GameCube library. It also goes for like $100 on eBay. So it's a nice way of saying fuck you to the people charging that much for used copies of an 18-year-old game. Anyway, moving on. Press A and it'll check whether it's a GameCube or a Wii disc. This is a GameCube disc, so it then asks if the disc is an unlicensed Daddl disc. What I think this is referring to is this old company Daddl, who manufactured a lot of cheat devices for video games back during this game generation and earlier ones. So what I think this could be is if you were trying to rip an action replay disc or something. In any case, we're not doing that, so choose no. One last prompt, it'll ask if you want to remember these settings. This can be useful if you're going to rip multiple games in a row, but for now I'm not going to be doing that, so I'll choose no. And there it goes! You can see it gives you an estimated time of about 10 to 12 minutes. So again, go ahead and do something else for a bit if you want. All GameCube games are the same size, 1.35 gigabytes, so I'm assuming that they're all going to take about this long. Once it's done, it'll give you a summary. As you can see, it says MD5 verified OK, which means the checksum ran and found no issues. Go ahead and press A if you want to rip a second game or B to quit back to the homebrew channel. I'm going to press A because now I'm going to rip a Wii game real quick. Everything is the same up to when you insert the disc, so let's just get to that point. Here, I'll be putting in Mad World, yet another fucking awesome game that hasn't been re-released. It'll initialize and you'll be brought to this screen. You have options for dual layer, chunk size, and new device per chunk. Let me walk you through it. Dual layer is the type of disc. Most Wii discs are single layered, but others like Super Smash Bros. Brawl are dual layered, meaning they are able to hold more data for bigger games. You will have to check for yourself which kind of disc the game you are ripping is. I know Mad World is a single layer disc, so I'm gonna choose no. Chunk size is where it gets a bit complicated. Basically, if you have a flash drive that is not big enough to hold the entirety of one Wii game, you can split the game into chunks and transfer the game to your computer in parts. That's why the new device option on the bottom is there. So when enabled, Clean Rip makes sure to wait between each chunk so you have time to move files off of the flash drive. So if you have a flash drive that is, say, 4 gigabytes, but your game is 5 gigabytes, you can set your chunk size to 3 then get the first three gigabytes of the game onto your flash drive. Put that on your computer, and then come back and get the last two gigabytes. Is that complicated enough for you? I'm gonna make things easy here and just work off the assumption that you have a big enough flash drive. 
because they are usually pretty large these days. Set the chunk size to max and say no to new device per chunk. Press A and it'll start just like the GameCube game. Wii games are a fair bit larger than GameCube games, so it understandably will take a bit longer. Just be patient. Once done, you'll get a familiar looking screen. Press A to rip another disc or B to quit. I'm done, so back to the computer we go. Press B, turn off the console and grab the flash drive. All right, the hard part's done. Go ahead and plug your flash drive back into your computer. You will be greeted with some ISO files with odd looking names as well as a few other things. All you really need are the ISO files, so go ahead and copy those to your computer wherever you want them. You can delete the other files if you want, but keep the DAT files. They are the ones we downloaded from redump.org for checksums. As for the names of the ISO files, they are simply the IDs of the games we ripped. You can find out which is which a couple of ways. Either just run them in Dolphin and see what comes up, or just look them up on Google. In my case, I have G8ME01 and RZZE8P, which are Paper Mario and Mad World, respectively. I gloss over it, but at this point these are completely usable. Stick them in Dolphin and they will play no problem. However, there is one more thing you can do. I mentioned before how GameCube games are all exactly the same file size, 1.35 gigabytes, and while these are not huge files by today's standards, not all of the games need quite that much space. So there is a lot of bloat, so to speak, in these files. Thankfully, compression of GameCube and Wii games has gotten very good to the point where some games can be brought down to being as small as a couple hundred megabytes. So I'll show you how to do that real quick before I go. First off, set your game directory in Dolphin. That way you can see them in a list instead of having to open them manually each time. Then right click on one and click convert file. You'll get some info on each of the file formats you can convert to, but if you are using the latest version of Dolphin, the best option is RVZ. The default settings are fine, so just click the convert button and tell it where to save the new file. After a few seconds, you'll have a substantially smaller file that is still completely playable within Dolphin. You can see it made Paper Mario an entire gigabyte smaller and Mad World is about half of its original size. The amount of space you save is different for each game, but it is worth doing in every circumstance that I've seen. This is also non-destructive, so if you want to convert the RVZ back to an ISO for whatever reason, you can very much do that. Just choose the RVZ, click Convert File, it should choose ISO by default, click Convert, and choose where to save it. And there you go, original ISO file restored. It's also worth mentioning you do not have to do this one by one if you are worried about that. Anyway, yeah, once again, congratulations for now having a working GameCube and Wii emulator. Now you can play games from my favorite console on your computer for years to come, and Nintendo can't say jack shit about it, as much as I am sure they would like to. Some games even have great enhancements like widescreen support and higher frame rates, as you can see with Luigi's Mansion here. This is not exclusive to just Dolphin either, Check out the original Demon Souls running in 60 frames per second. And you know how the servers for that game got nuked a while back? Well guess what? There's an entire online server on Demon Souls that you can use with other people playing an RPCS3. Everything I showed you today is completely morally justifiable and legally clean. It is a complete lie to suggest emulators are illegal things that require illegal downloads of copyrighted software in order to function. I have demonstrated why that is wrong, and I hope you enjoyed learning about this. I know making a big huge video about this is a very strong reaction to a tweet I saw that had maybe 10 likes, but it wasn't just about this one tweet. I see people suggest things like this all the time, so I just had enough. If you enjoyed this video, thank you, I appreciate it. This is by no means a typical video format for me, though if you want, feel free to check out my other videos on this channel and subscribe if you want to see more. I'm also on Twitch if you're into that. I've been playing Metroid Prime 2 lately, so come say hi. Anyway, that's enough for me today. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.